Bienvenue. Welcome everyone to our last episode of Dairy World Tour. My name is Anne Lacuda. I'm one of the health and wellness managers at Dairy West and I have had the pleasure of being your Dairy World Tour host over the past year. And today we have two fabulous guest speakers joining us again, Chef Michelle Redman and dietitian Mary Brighton. And they've invited us to join them for a French cooking party today where we're going to learn all about French culture and cuisine. And then we're also going to join them for a virtual vacation to all of their favorite spots throughout France. So before I officially introduce Michelle and Mary and share a bit of their background and, and they get to tell you their full stories, we are gonna cover a few housekeeping items just to make sure everyone has a wonderful experience today. So as I mentioned, and I can't even believe it, today is our final episode of Dairy World Tour. And on behalf of the Dairy West team, I wanna give a huge thanks to all of you for going on this incredible adventure with us. We have visited, by the end of the episode today, we have visited six countries together throughout the year, and we have tried all sorts of delicious dairy products created and produced in our Mountain West corner of the country in Idaho and Utah. And so although we won't be doing another Dairy World tour series of episodes and product boxes, um, we would really like to thank you for joining us on this adventure once again and encourage you to bring the Go Global Buy Local spirit to life in the future. Continue to be curious, explore other countries, cultures and cuisines, and support your local farmers and local food companies by buying local products. And of course, if you missed any of the previous episodes and you want to watch the recordings, check out unbottled.com. All of our episode recordings live there, as well as all of the episodes that we've featured on the recipes or on all of the recipes that we've featured on the episode. So if you didn't get a chance to try all of them, make sure to check out the website and give them a try. All right, so Dairy World Tour is not over yet. We still have France to visit. And all of you should have received your dairy product box last week. And so again, we have a really delicious array of cheeses. You received the Cache Valley Creamery Munster cheese, which is featured in Michelle's demo today. Manwaring handcrafted cheese out of Idaho created a special batch of their young mild cheddar specifically for Dairy World Tour. We have Park City Creamery's Treasure Brie style cheese. And then we also have Gossner Foods Old World Swiss cheese. So if you've been taking pictures and really loving your Dairy World Tour experience and posting them to social, make sure to use the hashtag Dairy World Tour so we can check out your photos too. About midway through the episode, Michelle is going to do her cooking demo. And so the featured recipe today is the roasted cauliflower gratin. So if you are cooking along with Michelle, make sure to do your prep steps. If you haven't already, you still have about 20 minutes to take care of those. So make sure to prep and measure out all of your ingredients, prepare Michelle's homemade bechamel, which was another recipe that you received and have all of your kitchen tools ready. And so we're gonna actually pop the recipe for the roasted cauliflower gratin into the chat right now, along with the bonus demo that Michelle's doing, which is her fromage four. So go ahead and open your chat and you should see both of those recipes there right now. And while you have it open, I also wanna encourage you guys to use the chat throughout the episode. We want to hear from you. We want you to engage with Michelle and Mary. And if you look at the bottom, you can notice that you can choose to chat with everyone that's on the call. Um, and if you have some friends and family members joining, you can choose to chat directly with one individual too. So again, use that, interact, engage, and have fun with it. Also ask your questions in the chat. We're going to be monitoring that chat throughout the whole episode. We'll collect the questions, and then we've set time aside at the end for a Q&A. So we'll take those questions and pose them to Michelle and Mary and get them answered for you then. And then during Michelle's demo, we're gonna actually be um, asking questions live. So if you have questions on any of the ingredients she's using or clarity on instructions, go ahead and ask them. I'm gonna be watching the chat coming in live and I'll pose those questions to her in the moment to make sure um, you have all the clarity you need to cook along. Okay, so before I officially introduce Michelle and Mary, we actually have a question for all of you. So you're gonna see a poll pop up on your screen in just a minute. And we wanna know what your experience with France is. Have you been to France before? On my bucket list, been there many times. Hey, maybe you've lived there just like Mary and Michelle have. 
So go ahead, we'll give everyone 30 seconds or so to answer the question and then we're gonna share the results. Lots of responses are coming in, this is fun. All right, look at that. So a lot of people have not been there. It's on your bucket list. A lot of people once, and just, just one person has lived there. So whoever's lived there, you should share your experiences with us in the chat throughout the presentation. All right, so let's get to know Michelle and Mary. Fun side note, Michelle and Mary actually met for the first time while they were both living in France and in school studying taste and gastronomy. So this is actually a photo of them um, back at Le Cordon Bleu in Paris. And Chef Michelle Redman is joining us as our uh, episode culinary expert. Michelle completed her culinary training in France at Le Cordon Bleu in Paris, and she's also a registered dietitian. Michelle is a cooking and culinary instructor as well as founder of the Taste Workshop. And then Mary Brighton is joining us as our nutrition expert for the episode today. Mary is a French trained culinary nutritionist. She's also a registered dietitian and she's currently practicing as an integrative dietitian nutritionist at Hackensack Meridian Integrative Health and Medicine in New Jersey. So let's give Michelle and Mary a very warm welcome today. You guys, we are so thankful to have the next hour to spend with you. I know it's going to be an absolute treat. And per typical Dairy World Tour fashion, we like to kick off the episodes by asking you a question so you can really let the audience get to know you in your own words and by telling your own story. So Chef Michelle, we're gonna kick it off with you. Go ahead and share with us what does food mean to you and how has your connection to France impacted that meaning? Well, I didn't have to live in France to know how strongly food connects us all together, but living there to get my culinary and gastronomy degree actually brought me closer to my dad. He had served in uh, France as a French translator for the U.S. Army, and he used to get me French kids cooks uh, books and I loved reading them. I enjoyed the words and even words like fromage for cheese. Fromage just sounded glamorous and romantic and sort of my love of the, the French language. And it also helped me start to appreciate living um, and eating and enjoying it more like my mom did and you might know somebody like my mom somebody who nurtures and uh, feeds her community and people maybe it's maybe it's you and my mom used to have parties and meals and get-togethers for families and neighbors all the time and I just watched that how she would make bread every time a new neighbor would would come in and that was just her way of sharing and caring so that's just something that I started to do and looking at food as bringing more vitamin L into your life, vitamin L as in love, the nutrient we all need more of. And my friend Mary taught me about vitamin G, which is the grounding vitamin to ground yourself. So Mary, I'll ask you the same question Anne asked me. What does food mean to you? And how does your connection to France, how has it impacted that? Well, first of all, that's beautiful, Michelle. But I, I think to answer that question, food talks to the emotional part of my soul. I think the person I owe this to is my grandmother who emigrated from what was then Czechoslovakia when she was 12 years old to the United States. Um, she didn't have an easy life, but she, food for her was love and being kind of normal. And she would come to our house every weekend and spend the whole day cooking with my mom. And then we would have these delicious meals together that were just very peaceful and, and nice. Um, fast forward to moving to France where I didn't speak a word of French except bonjour and au revoir. Um, but I really felt I could speak the language of cuisine and meals and emotion. Um, so I felt that that was a peaceful time for me as I trans, you know, started to be able to speak French more. And then now living back in the New Jersey since about five years, 
Uh, I bring that emotion and feeling every night around the dinner table with my family. It's just, you know, 20 minutes, half hour when we eat and we eat with candles and soft lighting and music. And I try to encourage that mindful kind of emotional attachment um, that's beautiful with food. And I, I do feel that my, my family will carry that tradition on with them as they, as they get older. So I think we're ready though to start our virtual vacation. So So the only thing you need to pack for this um, virtual vacation is your appetite because Michelle and I are going to take you on an insider view of all the hidden secrets in France. France is the largest country in the European Union and it is the most important agricultural producer. It has a unique geographical location and it is a bridge between Northern and Southern Europe. It is bound on the West by the Atlantic Ocean and the South by the Mediterranean Sea and the mountain ranges of the Alps and the Pyrenees. We have divided France though in different regions and we're gonna take you in four different regions. We're gonna take you on the top, the north, um, the northeast, down the southeast, southwest, and then the northwest. But first we need to, oops, sorry. Let me just go back. Sorry about that. First, we need to give a little uh, background about the motto of France. So the motto is liberty, equality, and fraternity. This motto started in the French Re Revolution and is really part of like the cultural heritage of France. Um, it is embodied, this motto in the tricolors of France's blue, white, and red. And this note is the same colors as our American flag. So we are going to start and uh, end up in Paris. But first I wanna take you on a short day trip to the Chateau de Chantilly. So imagine yourself in this architectural masterpiece of the 18th century with its gardens that were inspiration for Versailles and, and the antique paintings that are the second largest outside the uh, art museum of the Louvre in Paris. But that's not the charm of the Chateau. Um, this chateau contains the largest horse stables in Europe and also a, a horse museum and live equestrian shows um, that you can, you can go and watch. You know, when you're in there, you can almost feel like the dignity of this castle and the parties that happened about 300 years ago, because they, they used to do like hunting parties. I'm sure at that time, maybe there was some champagne flowing so we have to uh, head down to learn a little bit about these magical bubbles because Champagne is quite close down from the Chateau de Chantilly. Um, Champagne, I do call these magical bubbles because you know they it not it's not just its unique taste. It has what they French call like a terroir. So they, the, the taste and the bubbles are connected to the weather that's unique there, the chalky soil and the savoir faire of, um, of Champagne. I can say that in drink, tasting these in some of the, uh, the Roman caves over there in the city of Reims, you, know, you get a really feel of what um, is back, the background of this drink and what makes it so unique. When we're in Reims though, after a day of tasting, we, this is a, a Gothic cathedral that's really dominating in the center of Reims. Just walk in and what you can see at different times of day are the shimmering lights from the stained glass. And then if you are a Marc Chagall fan like I am, he redesigned some of the windows in this cathedral in the 1970s. So it's a great look um, to walk in there and look at that. But it is a Christmas season and we need to head down to Strasbourg, which has the uh, oldest Christmas market since the 1500s 
with about 2 million visitors that go every year. So it starts off in the main square of Strasbourg, but it trickles out into this, what they call the Petite France. So it's like a um, medieval buildings with their sloping roofs and open lofts. And as you walk through and buy some gifts and enjoy the mulled wine, you really build an appetite for one of the typical cuisine that's there. So this, this cuisine of this region is really highly influenced by Germany, which is right over the river there. Um, this is delicious. It's cooked like in an open fire and it's um, a, tart, a creme fraiche topped with some onions, lardon, and another cheese. Uh, and I like mine, what's called forestier, which they, means from the forest and they put mushrooms on it. So it's a, it's a great dish to discover when you're visiting Strasbourg. But another uh, scenic and historical area to visit near Strasbourg is the Burgundy region. So this region is known for its wine and its cuisine and probably a mustard that you all have in your refrigerator, Dijon mustard. The best way to discover this is taking a week and renting a canal boat and just drifting along on one of these ancient waterways like the Sone River. You can stop along, um, do some wine tasting and discover cuisine like beef bourguignon, which is a, a beef cooked in Burgundy or a coke to coco vin. So Michelle knows, this is Michelle's <laughs> picture, yeah. Yeah, Julia Child popularized this uh, French dish by substituting what was used, a rooster, for instead chicken. And it's cooked in red wine and it's a lot of fun to cook because you can see here from my flambe in my French cocotte. <laughs> oh, and Mary, let me comment on the Mont d'Or because it is my favorite piece. It is aged in the spruce wood and it's available only in the fall and the winter. It has a creamy, lovely flavor when it's at room temperature. But what you need to do is put it under a toaster, like a broiler or in the oven, and you have instant flambe. It cooks right in there and it gets really delicious. And flambe is great for winter and skiing. So Mary, what do you want to say about that? Well. It is ski season and we have to head over to the Alps with which has 173 Alpine and cross country ski resorts. It's the largest ski you know, resort area in the world. Um, if you're brave though, uh, you know, you can take, um, come back in like a warmer weather and head and spend the night in this Mont Blanc, Mont Blanc Goutte hut. Um, it's not really like a hotel. It's more like a way to protect yourself from the elements. Um, but you can get a bed, a meal. There is no running water though. Um, and then you get up really early and walk up five hours to the top of Mont Blanc. So that's something to, something to do for anyone who loves hiking. The, the cuisine though in the area. So after a day of skiing, you really, the best thing to eat are these like delicious hearty dishes like uh, gratin dauphinoise, um, which is potatoes cooked in milk. And then you layer it in the pan with some more cheese and put that in the oven. So it's very, you know, like really fills you up after in, uh, expending your energy skiing. Um, but I have to say, interestingly, heading a few hours south after like that, you really head into one of my most favorite areas of France, I call it like the aromatherapy region, because when you're there and you have the wind blowing and you're smelling the herbs to Provence and breathing in the lavender, it's just a way of just feeling relaxed. Um, stop and get an aperitif, some olives. It is the only area of France where they typically eat Mediterranean. So that's the area in Provence. Um, and if you wanted to make your friends jealous, head over to Menton, which is right on the border of Italy. And you can literally put like one foot in Italy, one foot in France and be like, hey, guess what? I was in two countries in the same morning. Um, it's also, it's very cute little village in a city, but it has the most sunny days of all of France. So that's like reason that I would go there. It's very beautiful climate. 
But in a little, but heading back over to the Pyrenees where I used to live, we have to stop up in a little rustic um, kind of an area not many people know about, Auvergne, with its volcanic soil, where they grow Les Puy en Valais lentils for the last 2,000 years. And of course, I've, I've done this tour. You can stop and go to visit the uh, tour, the caves where they make Rockford cheese. So there's special caves in, in a Rockford village. Um, and you learn about how this mold, it's called penicillin roccaforte, uh, gives the cheese its unique look and flavor. Um, the sh back in like uh, the, I would call it the olden days, uh, but the shepherds actually would use this cheese to heal wounds, to prevent them from gangrene. Although the, the, the penicillin Roccoforte is not like the penicillin that we maybe are typically known for and know of. But we have to head to where my heart uh, heart has been, still is for, for about 15 years, a land where there is still a lot of shepherds. So this is the Pyrenees region. So I lived about maybe 30 minutes north in Po, but the picture really does look like that um, in the summer. If you go in June, you can actually go on a walk, a transhumanist walk to walk the animals, the sheep up to the top of the Pyrenees. Um, but it is also a great time of year. This time of year is a great time to ski. And what's really cool is you can like go skiing on a Saturday and then go over to the Atlantic coast and hang out and sunbathe in front of the ocean on a Sunday. So a great region with a great climate. It's also a region where they have a lot of these like country dishes. So cassoulet um, is a dish that the recipe slightly changes depending on what city you're eating it in, but it's usually made with some kind of pork or duck um, for, and it's cooked for about 24 to 36 hours. And if you're lucky to have uh, a cassoulet made with these uh, holy grail of white bean called Arico Tarbez, um, that these are just the treasure they're grown like north, um, like so, like just north of Spain. Um, I think even Michelle, like yeah, so Chef Michelle has those <laughs> in her cabinet. So grab some of those to bring home in your suitcase. Um, they, that's a really wonderful bean to try. But we're heading up towards the, you know, up on the Atlantic coast to another big, it's another city. After Paris is probably my favorite city in France. It, grow, it grows on you, um, Bordeaux. So the cool thing about Bordeaux, it has the uh, largest reflecting pool in the world. So people hang out there and they take pictures. Uh, just a cool thing, night and day. You also can go um, on their tram system. So it's a really efficient tram system in Bordeaux. And then one of the um, one of the tram stops is this amazing wine museum called City de Vin or a city of the wine. So it is for a wine museum for all ages and you learn about wine from all over the world. But if you look just already on the architecture of this building, it's so the bottom is like a, a gnarled wine kind of uh, vine. And then the top is supposed to be movement and wine kind of swirling in a glass. Uh, and then inside you feel that too. So the inside, the lighting and the architecture is also very beautiful. And it's just a, a, any wine lovers listening and put this on your bucket list. This is something to, something to visit. But then we're gonna head over about an, oh, an hour um, east of Bordeaux to another heart area. It's the first place when I landed in France that I spent two weeks rafting down the Dordogne River. So that's a, um, that river there and camping on the side of the river, great campgrounds. Uh, you, there's some castles you can see on your screen. So this is an area known for like med medieval castles to visit. And it's just a place to get lost in the little villages and enjoy some of the local cuisine like foie gras, duck. Um, you know, it's just, it's just a, a wonderful place to discover. Um, and if you do love castles, like I love castles, another great area is the called the Valley of the of the Kings, the Lore Valley. So this is um, a castle that I visited and that's what, what it looks like. It's the Chateau de Uze, which was the inspiration for the book from Charles Perrault called Sleeping Beauty. Um, so you can um, visit some of these, uh, these palaces, 
best way to do it, rent a bike, going castle to castle, taste some great wine like Sancerre, Polyfumé, some of the best goat cheese in France that was made right there on the, on the villages on the river. Um, it's, a, it's really nice. There's like a thousand miles of these underground tunnels, which were quarried to make these castles. Um, but also you can do something super fun like Michelle did. <laughs> I did. I, I, I went on a truffle hunt, and you should too. <laughs> um, traditionally, you know, pigs sniff out truffles, but here you see Tuck Tuck, who is a border collie that his, his human, Louis, trained to enjoy hunting truffles in the Loire Valley. And Tuck Tuck found this large truffle about six inches underground attached to a root, and then we ate it, or some of it. <laughs> and, uh, but unfortunately, most people's experience with truffles is via truffle oil, and typically that is a synthetic flavored oil. It's not the real truffles. So hopefully at some point we all get to try truffles. <laughs> And another, another uh, wonderful thing to, to do um, is to visit the where they make this special flair de sel or this very expensive, um, well, as far as salts are concerned, sel uh, uh, de Guerin. So the reason it is expensive because the weather has to be perfect, not much wind and sunny to either actually you know, get the salt out of these marches. And each march only produces maybe 2.2 pounds per day. So Michelle, you know about this area. I did a salt tour and you can do salt tours all throughout France because there are salt marshes distributed different places, but this was South Brittany and the hardest thing was to try and hold the loose de, de, a fleur, which is the big long rake. And it's, it's related to the salt bee crystals looking like flowers. So uh, fleur de sel, the crystal actually looks like a shape of a flower. So they take these huge rakes that are about 12 feet long and lightly scrape the top of the water. I couldn't, I couldn't even hold the rake, so I failed. <laughs> Yeah, so right down south of Brittany, though, but Brittany is another great um, region. It's it's like wild and wonderful. It's highly influenced from from Celtic uh, Celtic um, Celtic influences from the UK. But go to the uh, Point de Raza. It's like the the point that's actually the closest to America. I actually did that and said hi to my friends in New Jersey. But you know, it's a great region to discover. Also to to the cuisine, love the. These like uh, these they call them the galette made with buckwheat flour and it can make them savory or 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 sweet but savory is really nice to drunk with cider so wonderful wonderful region um, and as we head over to um, the one of my favorite spots I'm going to show you you have to stop and pick up some seafood because that's Brittany is really well known especially for its oysters um, but oops. I'm sorry. Yeah, but for its oysters, but we're heading up to now towards the um, Normandy region. And here's a little gem that I wanted to bring out to you. So Normandy has a uh, camembert, as you know, but um, they have these small producers that produce camembert that's like dictated by what they call Appellation Origin Protégé, where the camembert has to be made a certain way. So the one I want you to discover, it's one that's made without uh, milk that's not pasteurized from certain cows that graze in, a, in an, an area. Um, and they're, they have to be from this milk from these cows. So find a small producer and, and really taste this, uh, taste this cheese because I've had the, the Appellation Origin Protégé and it tastes completely different than the, the camembert that you may know and buy. Um, so uh, that's really uh, something really great to do. But we are heading, uh, it's now what time? It is about, uh, oh my gosh, about 8.30 in Paris. So I, you know, I just wanted to leave you and say, that France, each region is really unique. You know, it has its specialties and influences from its geographic location, you know, its savoir faire. But, you know, what is France? You know, it's not just Paris, but one thing about wherever you are in France is the way that the French eat. It's really highly based on conviviality, which is eating with other people. And it has a certain meal, you know, structure that I'll discuss, you know, at, with my part at the end. But, um, 
I don't know. It's it's a great place, and I really hope that this tour has kind of you know influenced you to to put the Francis on your bucket list. But no, Michelle, Chef Michelle, we're ready to join you for aperitif. What do you think? Excellent. Bienvenue chez moi. So welcome to my home and to our cooking party. And I can okay, I can I can see you now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I want to see all you, all of you here. So just the little boxes is just not quite enough. But Mary and I uh, often, when we invite friends over or relaxing before a meal with family, we often have aperitif time, which is a common ritual in France, and it includes a beverage and some nibbles. But the most important thing is that you get a chance to slow down. It marks the separation of your busy day with some time to prioritize relaxing with your favorite people. So the beverage is typically something light. It's not gonna be something heavy. So I'll, I want to show you some examples of that, but I think first I need to, to cheers to you all. So Mary, what is your favorite French cheers? <laughs> I like Chin Chin. Chin Chin's great, great. And I, I like uh, a Votre Santé or short, you would say Santé, which is a cheers to your, to your health. So we're gonna cheers to you all, cheers to your health. So a Votre Santé. Excellent, Sheila, I see Sheila, bonjour Sheila. <laughs> and I see some of my friends, Sybil, uh, bonjour Sybil in, in France. We've got some Paris people who are attending. So you might, might be an aperitif time for you now. <laughs> But let me talk just a moment about the actual um, beverage. It's, you know, it's not like a heavy cocktail. It's not a red wine. It's typically gonna be something light. Like I have here a French fortified wine that's a lille aperitif. I have a, a cassis, which is a black currant. And you see this in the Cure or Cure Royale uh, cocktails, which is well known. Or you might choose to do something non-alcoholic. There are so many wonderful bitters out now. This is an orange non-alcoholic bitter. This is a grapefruit ginger one. Add them to some sparkling water and you can have an aperitif that is lighter, maybe for a Sunday afternoon. And the, the focus is to not fill up on nibbles and uh, beverages. The idea is to just stimulate your appetite a little bit. You don't want to spoil your dinner. So typically you might have some very small nibbles put out initially. And here is an example of something that, you know, similar to what French friends have served to me, shared with me. So I've got some Marcona al almonds, some little crackers with olives in them. And then I have some olives, cornichons, which are mini gherkins. I can't live without them. I always have at least a back of six of them in my pantry. And some little uh, sweetie drop peppers, red provolone, um, that you can get from Trois Poisson uh, brand. So you know, there's just something simple like that. I um, do have a book coming out on low stress, entertaining, and ways to bring friends and family together into in sort of a low-key happy hour or the aperitif. And I talk about also how to have shareable meals with people that, that look like uh, something simple that comes together that could be a happy hour, but it ends up being a meal. We do that in the US uh, sometimes on accident <laughs> in France. It's called an uh, din uh, aperitif dinatoire. So it's a conscious effort at, at doing a dinner that way based on sort of appetizers and, and bringing things together simply. So that is, that brings us to a couple of cheeses. And uh, Mary, I'm gonna say first, the typically you don't see uh, cheeses at an aperitif. Uh, on a, you know, when I've served that to friends, French friends, at first they were confused, you know, the first thing they see is cheeses because cheese is typically a main, one of the main courses. But, um, so just a comment about that. If you want to show Mary such a cheese board, so we'll see Mary. Yeah. Cheese so board. Um, love my love uh, the cheese board. Uh, I'll show you. I took the cheeses from the box. Let me just show you. And I just have have them out. I I cut some of them in half. 
and I have them out just on a plate with a with a knife. And then I included just a little cherry jam. So some people like to top it just with a touch of cherry jam. So that's you know my simple cheese board. Cheese board. And when you serve that here in the U.S. with to friends after dinner, they're like, woohoo! It's such oh, yeah. a they totally to love do. it. Love right. it. Yeah, they pat we pass it along, and it's the highlight of the of the dinner. To be honest. Excellent. Well, and I did want to mention that in the, so one of the recipes you got was the spirited apricot brie. So the apricot jam had a little, a little buzz going on. And the brie that, this is the typical size that would, is for written for the recipe, but we did get in our kits the park creamery brie style. So just get two of these and be set for that. And we also got a the man wearing that Anne had mentioned, and this was made just for you all. So it is a very young, fresh cheese. And because of that, you might just only get some milky buttery notes, but in order to really let it do its thing, I would, uh, if you haven't unwrapped it, keep it, keep it wrapped because that's the best way to age a cheese. And I always like to say that Age doesn't matter unless you're a cheese. So we're going to keep it in the fridge for a month or longer. You shouldn't see any mold forming because it's vacuum packed. And what happens during that aging process is that proteins break down. They develop into what sometimes is called flavor crystals. Those little white hard things that you'll see in cheese sometimes. And those have little hints of, it could be savory or sweet even, or, or salty. So those are nice things that have happened. And related to aging and making your cheese, let's talk about the first recipe. How does that sound? Okay, I wanted to do some more. So the first recipe is for fromage four. This is what you've got. And I know it looks like fromage fort, but the, the T is, is silent. And this is a great way to use up little bits of cheese you have in your refrigerator that maybe you had little nubs and things and, and you need something to do with them. And traditionally, there's a really clever way of using up those cheeses by putting them together in a dip with a soft cheese and semi-hard cheeses. And that's what fromage four is. But you can use any kind of cheese that you want. For this recipe, we're using the Gassner, um, Gassner Swiss. And so I have that. And then I also have I put some cream cheese in here. And then I also have a blend of Gruyere. And I always have Gruyere in the refrigerator. I'm just a little bit uh, je suis acro, the French might say. I'm a little addicted to, uh, to Gruyere. It's just such a versatile cheese. And there's a lot of, lots of cheeses that I keep in my fridge. Both Anne was mentioning local. There's so many good local cheeses that I can get as well. And so that's going to happen. And then I'm going to put some garlic in here. This is uh, I wrote it for two cloves. You could put more if you want. I did learn though for my fresh my uh, chefs in France that my idea of a garlic clove was like as you can see here was was this. Their idea was that. <laughs> Mine, theirs. So <laughs> that was a learning lesson in flavor uh, differences in flavor. And then we're also going to put some white wine in here. It's a third of a cup of white wine. And this allows it to have some extra moisture. It increases the uh, little hint of acidity and uh, with a dry Riesling, which dry Rieslings are so flexible for anything that that works really well here. I've also made it with non-alcoholic wine. You can make it with, I've tested it with rice wine vinegar. So you really just want to balance of the, the two, the soft and the semi-hard cheeses together. So why would you make this? I should have told you that first. Because it's so versatile. One, it's easy. Look, I mean, I didn't really even have to measure. Uh, so it's the easiest thing to throw together. But you can put it with, you know, it's a, it's a dip. So here's an example of it uh, being the roll of a dip. But you can also put it on 
pizzas, put it on flatbreads, stuff it in things, uh, make us a, a sandwich spread with that, add it to a pasta, and it can end up being a sauce. Uh, there's so many things you can do to play with this, and you can make it your own. For example, I'll probably end up adding some sun-dried tomatoes to this, and some some hello, some pickled pickled little bits of pickled um, spices to it, and and then mix it. So I'm not going to go ahead and blend this here because you don't really need to hear my whiny blender, <laughs> but I showed you what what it looks like when it's nice and and creamy. So. That is one of my favorite things to um, have and, and use for many different things. Michelle, is yes. it served best warm or cold? Elaine asked. Oh, oh, thank you for asking that question. That's excellent. It's best to take it out, just like we were discussing how you know cheeses are alive and the refrigerator you know slows down their their process, their uh, that, their aging process, but taking them out for an hour, sometimes even two hours before you use them really allows the aromatic compounds to evolve and be noticeable. So it really is a better thing to do, even with like a, a cheese dip like this. It's a soft cheese dip, so you don't have to take it out an hour or not depending on your temperature or an hour and a half. But many of my French friends schooled me when I lived there. You took the cheese out too early. <laughs> Michel, <laughs> c'est ton problème. <laughs> so, um, so that's, it also stores well. It's good for, you know, a week or longer in your fridge and it freezes well. You know, a lot of cheeses freeze really well, so it can freeze really well. So that's the fromage four. So let me take you to um, ask something warm, a warm cheese now. Uh, we're gonna make a gratin. Are there any questions, Anne? Yeah, one more came in actually on the fromage four. Uh, Patty asked, are there any types of cheese that you should not use when making it? That's a good question. A Parmesan. Um, a hard, hard cheese, if you have a really good blender or you go ahead and do a fine rapé, I mean, grate it really fine, then you could. But if, if a hard, hard aged cheese is just a little bit tougher. So, okay, well, let's do a gratin. It's, we're now in winter, so it's a perfect dish for that. And a gratin is both a dish, like this dish I have here, um, but it also refers to the browning that you get when you put a, a dish under the broiler and you get that nice browning color. And a gratin will often have a, a milk base or a bechamel, and that's where you're going to get a lot of the, the color from. Mary showed the gratin was earlier, and that was a perfect example of that. And the gratins are great because they tend to be a vegetable-based dish. And, and so you can use one or two vegetables. It's not a lot of vegetables. You're not making a casserole and you're making it very simply. And so it comes together really fast. It's a great way to use leftover vegetables in your refrigerator. And I'm gonna start with the, uh, actually putting the, the cauliflower together. Normally I would, Throw, put the cauliflower into roast and then start on the, the bechamel. The bechamel takes less than 10 minutes, but I'm gonna go ahead and start warming up what I started on the bechamel. So with the recipe card you got, you're gonna start with a, a cauliflower head and you can, there's different ways that you can, can start trimming your cauliflower, but I typically will just put, pop my knife in uh, to the center and knock off the, the leaves there. And then I'm ready to go. And however you want to do it, you can be rustic and pull apart, give it to some kids to get some extra exercise. <laughs> so that's one way to do that is just to rip it apart. Um, or you can just go in here and cut the florets off. I do tend to keep a lot of the stem because I don't want to waste it. My buddy Sybil just, just did a book on wasting, not wasting food while you're cooking. And so that's always in my mind how to, how to use all those parts that we're not using. So you can take it and um, break it up into smaller pieces. Depends how much, how, how you want that to look. But I do tend to keep some flat pieces. And I like that because when I have flat pieces, then I can get some more browning action on the, the roast. Because if it's flat against the surface of the 
pan, you're gonna get more flavor. Color means flavor. And so that's what we're gonna look for with that. There we go. And I'm going to just put it in this small, this is a quarter sheet baking sheet, which is really small, but this is a really small cauliflower. So I'm not, uh, I would have less energy going into washing because I am the laziest cook ever. And then we're just gonna add some olive oil to that, about a tablespoon or a tablespoon and a half, whatever, that was probably, or about two. And the reason we want it to be well coated, I'm gonna go ahead and get a little grungy here, get my, my uh, cauliflower well coated. You could put it in a, a bowl with the cauliflower and toss it like you would do it in a commercial kitchen, but then you, somebody has to wash that bowl. So again, anytime I can save on um, that kind of energy, I will. And so I get it well coated and then I'm going to put about a quarter teaspoon of salt and the salt here is not to make it, I don't have to measure by the way, because I know exactly what my pinch is. <laughs> I've measured it. And now I don't have to take out a measuring teaspoon or washes. <laughs> so, um, so that's a quarter teaspoon of salt. But I don't, it's not there to make the, the cauliflower salty. It's there to make it have the natural flavors of the cauliflower evolve. So it tastes more like cauliflower. That is what salt does for vegetables. I've taught many classes on salt and there are many cool ways to reduce salt intake, but with vegetables, oof, it's really so helpful. And that's, that's what we do. We pop it in the oven for about 10 minutes um, and then check it. And then a total time of about 18 to 20 minutes, depending on your oven. I do tend to start cauliflower on the bottom rack and then raise it to the top rack. It does depend on how thick your sheet is and your temperature, but that is um, a quick way to to get your cauliflower um, hot, drop it in the middle rack. If it's if that's easier for you and you prefer to just keep it simple, whatever works for you. And so I have a roasted version of it right here. So I did that this morning. So you don't have to hear my loud convection of it. I'm really all about trying to save your ears today. <laughs> my loud things. So the bechamel is a wondrous sauce. It is a white sauce that is super flexible. It has um, been around for over 300 years, yet we see it showing up all over the place still. Because of that, it's in, used in many cultures, in many comfort dishes, and it, it's one of those romantic sounding names, bechamel, that I think is glamorous. <laughs> it's just a simple white sauce. But you, in the US, we see it often in gravy or it's, it's something synonymous with macaroni and cheese. So it's the basis of a lot of recipes. And I think that sometimes people have made it too fussy. It is really a hearty sauce. I am putting together, I've got here my roux, which is butter and flour. And I'm gonna add some water to it. And I already started pre-cooking this a little bit. So it's beginning to, um, come together and my recipe is a little bit uh, richer, or I should say in terms of flour, it's thicker. Typically the way to remember bechamel is two, 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 or one, one, one. So you don't have to ever look at a, a cookbook. So it is, if you want two cups of bechamel, you're gonna use two cups of milk, two cups of flour, I mean, two teaspoons, tablespoons of flour and two tablespoons of butter. If I want to make one cup of bechamel, I'm going to use one cup of milk, one tablespoon of butter, and one tablespoon of flour. Really easy ratio. A little bit more rhubarb flour will make it thicken faster. And the idea behind um, cooking it until you see it sandy and you see bubbles, because there's water in butter and the bubbles will evaporate, then that is going to get you um, the starch molecules begin to, granules begin to break down. And that allows them to absorb more liquid. And that improves the emulsification so that a bechamel can last a little bit longer. So that's the idea behind the bechamel. Any questions, Anne? 
So no questions yet. A lot of people saying they cannot wait to make this tonight. And if they're in Utah, we got a ton of snow today. So it's the perfect <sighs> cozy, cheesy recipe to enjoy tonight. And then Lisa said something funny she, for the fromage four. She said, you can make it fromage tray four by including Limburger. <laughs> I like that. That's great. <laughs> the, um, the, the whisk for this, I'm using a, it's kind of like a, a balloon whisk. I don't really need it in a saucier pan because a saucier pan has a nice curvy, you know, uh, bottom. Whereas if you have a more straight edged one, you might use something. I've got just a few little whisks here, my little whisk bouquet. <laughs> so you might want to use a French whisk. This is a small French whisk that has a more narrow. Um, so it can get in the corners of, of the, the pan. Some people like to use a flat whisk for sauces like this. So that is, is there as well. And I'm gonna try and get this up to temperature a little quickly. But the um, other thing about the, the bechamel is that it's a French mother sauce. It's one of the five French mother sauces. And then there are derivatives of it, which sometimes are called the daughter sauces. And so for this dish, we start with the bechamel, but then we're gonna add the Cache Valley Munster cheese. And it is unusual to put sliced cheese <laughs> in the dish, but this is what they had and it smells lovely and it's got a nice texture. It's a melting cheese, so it does work great for this. Now we'll point out that Munster in French, uh, in, in France uh, is not, doesn't have an E in it. And it is a cheese that monks made. And apparently French immigrants that came to Wisconsin started making Munster cheese. So that's my understanding. I am not a Wisconsin expert, but that, that's what I understand about that. So once I take a, a bechamel and I add a Mornay to it, um, I mean, I add cheese to it, then it's gonna become a, um, a Mornay sauce. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And that's, I'm still waiting for my, I'm using a burner I don't usually use. Here. And another thing is that people often say, oh, you have to, you have to use warm milk to get a bechamel together. And, and, and really it's just having room temperature milk is, is all you really need. Um, and that, that just, that's just is quicker. It just allows the starch mo molecules to come together faster. So. That is, that's all we're gonna do. And I just wait for about 10 minutes or less. Sometimes it takes, it's done in about six minutes. And then we have our morning sauce. Well, Michelle, you know what? I just love how you remind us how easy bechamel can be, you know? I mean, I, I you know, I have to do this more often because my kids will eat anything when it's covered with bechamel. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. it's a no brainer, you know, vegetables, whatever, you know? Um, yeah. So thanks for that. So yeah, we're heading on. Great yeah. So, so yeah, we, you don't have to wait for my bechamel to thicken. You already know what's going to happen. The drama is going to be, it will thicken. <laughs> and then I will add some rosemary to it. This is a rosemary and bechamel. Actually, I'll put it in now. It is amazing how quickly the bechamel will pick up the, the rosemary. And the only thing I will mention is that you probably, if you looked at my recipe and you added it up, you'd think, Michelle, that makes more than two cups of ingredients. And you said it will only yield one and three quarters ingredients. And that's because you have evaporation of the water that's in the milk. Uh, and you also, with the rosemary especially, you pull it out, you're gonna have, you're gonna have nice, thick, yummy bechamel. <laughs> And so you can suck on it if you want, but just tossing, it does reduce the quantity uh, just a little bit. And this recipe also shows up in the Petit VA recipe that um, I sent you all for the broccoli and cheddar Petit VA. And that's what the Manwaring um, cheese was designed for. So, all right. Mm -hmm. Lovely. All right, I think we're, we're... Head over to some of the nutrition part. So, 
You know, Michelle, I find it so fascinating, you know, when you when, when you talk about bechamel and, you know, the butter and the cream, how, to, how, how the French love those kind of foods. And you wonder, like, how can they consume, you know, these foods and yet have low rates of cardiovascular disease and low life expectancies? I mean, you know, this is what they call the French paradox. Originally, they thought maybe it was due to the red wine and the phytonutrient that's in the red wine called Rivesterol. However, recent studies that are done with checking red wine um, outside of France doesn't uh, have the same results. So, you know, there must be something else um, going on, whether what the French are eating or, you know, maybe it's not just what they're eating, but, you know, how they eat, the process of eating, um, which is based highly on convivial dining. Uh, so conviviality refers to like the actual how, you know, the process, sitting down around the table, taking time to eat in a social setting um, and the pleasure of eating, you know, and you do it usually with your special peeps. <laughs> These are my four special peeps there. They're my four children. We were convivial dining in a village restaurant in France. Um, and that's really part of like the French cultural identity with food is that you do enjoy this food in a convivial setting. But there is also like a model that is done throughout France. Um, it's called like the six points of the French eating model. So it's three of the main meals so breakfast, lunch and dinner, eating, eating you know, socially. Uh, breakfast, you know, it's early on, obviously before work or before school. Lunch is around the same time every day, around 12.30. Dinner is later, I call it lighter and later. So it's around 7, 7.30. Um, and it's usually not always meat-based because the main meal at lunch is very much more like, a, I would consider higher calorie, protein, fat, and so on. Um, there is a longer meal preparation and length. So especially when you're having like a gastronomic meal, um, which is on the weekends and during the holidays. And there is a structured meal uh, with three parts. So a first course, which is called the entree, the main course, and then the um, last course. Um, and this is a pattern that's done even in, in informal meals. Um, the last course can be typically be like a, a cheese plate that you put down, or it can be a yogurt or a piece of fruit. Um, but it's also highly, um, the, the main thing is that it's highly based on taste. So taste is really important to French. You know, they promote it from young age. Um, and what carries taste in food? It's fat. So, you know, healthy fats, uh, Fats are always like in meals, usually complementing the taste of the meal. And this does, does equate to having a better taste. Um, there is a lot of uh, emphasis on variety and eating in season, eating local. And there is also that savoir faire. So kind of what I showed you in the beginning, which each region having their own kind of specialty, their own products that's also brought in on the, in this French eating model. So we are in the time of uh, holidays. And so this gastronomic meal is seen a lot during December and January, um, but it's also on the weekends too. And it starts off with an aperitif. So Michelle uh, talked a little bit about the aperitif. It's usually an hour, an hour and a half. It's not done at the table. It's done in a different location, maybe in front of the fireplace. Then you go and sit down um, around the table. You the first course starts, there's a wine that matches. Then you have that goes away of the main course again with a different wine maybe. Then you have the cheese course, um, dessert and a digestive. So that's like a, um, it might be what they call eau de vie or a brandy. It's like a very strong alcohol that's uh, drunk in very small quantity at the end of the meal to help the digest. Um, and I have to say, I'd love, you know, this thing where matching the, the, the meal with the wine, like I, I also, you might have gotten your um, wheel in the mail. I love this. I use this. Uh, so you can, you can really look and see like, okay, I'm having this cheese. What, what, what kind of wine goes well with it? There's a great online version too that I use unbottled.com slash matchmaker, which has like also beers that match with cheeses and cider. So it's a great, a like great little resource, and it's really, really fun. I think, I think it adds to the taste when you match, when you match in your food with your, with your beverages. 
Um, so food is always a celebration, even informal meals, but that gastronomic meal actually is a protected a culture by UNESCO, which is like a United Nations educational um, pro uh, uh, protection, protection, and it started in 2010. So that pattern is now known like in the world as this is what the French do during their gastronomic meals. Um, but again, you know, this food is a celebration. It's done every day. Like I told you with, I sit down with my family and we have this 20 minutes every night, a half hour of enjoying a meal. It's a type of celebration that, that you do every day. Um, but the French, you know, so I have to really talk to you about, you know, French cheese, like there's more varieties of French cheese than there are days in the year, believe it or not. It is served after the main dish. Um, I, I showed you the cheese plate, but for example, uh, even an informal meal, it would go in the center of the table or like if you're having a gastronomic meal or I have my dinner parties that I call Paris Bistro night, I have the cheese plate handed to a guest and they hold it uh, for the next guest, cut a piece or two, and it just goes around the table like that. And that's that's just really fun. And then, like I said, if you want to do that, um, you know, start that habit around your home, I promise it will be, oh, it's a really big hit. Uh, typical dairy foods. So some of them you know, but I'll, I'll highlight a few that you may have not heard about. So creme fraiche, it's a type of sour cream. Um, and then you, you know yogurt, but fromage frais. So that is also a, like a fermented um, milk, but it's not, it's, it's not like yogurt, there are live cultures, but they add rennet in it. So it makes it like a curd in a way. Um, to be called fromage frais, it has to have live cultures. But if you stop the fermentation process, then you have fromage blanc. But these things like fromage frais and fromage blanc, they're really nice like for dessert too. Um, people have it for breakfast. So they're just like, a, I don't know, like a soft kind of cream cheese. But if you're over there visiting, definitely, to put these on your menu because they're great. They're really great to try. Um, so the French paradox, you know, I don't, I don't think it's the wine. It, it's, some of it might be the wine, but I, I really think it's, you know, how uh, the French just take time to do the convivial eating um, and just, uh, you know, enjoy the meals, um, probably some of the uh, the nutrients too, um, based on your know, variety, uh, um, you know, eating local. Um, that's also really important there, you know, going to the market and buying your food at the market. So all that is combined, you know, really shows that the French have this really good longevity and aging well. Um, that's, you know, still connected to eating things like butter, cream and dairy and bechamel. Um, so the, the French, though, do, did re recently in 2019 kind of revamp their dietary guidelines. I, I love them. I'll show you I'll show you what they look like on the next slide. But the main uh, points of it is they want to promote French food and culinary heritage. They also want to decrease food insecurity so that everyone has the right to have good quality food. And they educate the population about food and taste. And they have adopted, it's not like the food label that we see here in America necessarily, but they label uh, a nutrition label on, on foods. And um, it'll say like A, B, C, D, E. And the higher, the higher uh, letters mean that there's less nutrition in that food. So people are getting used to have those foods less often. So the French uh, dietary guidelines, uh, this, this one I'm showing you here is for French adults. So uh, for pregnant women and children, these will be published probably this year. It's what an is anticipated, but I really like it because um, it's simple. Um, you can see, so uh, Augmenté on the left, they want to increase fruits and vegetables of any kind, even frozen, um, but increase fruits and vegetables, increase things like beans, chickpeas, increase nuts um, uh, and non-salted nuts. Uh, la fait maison over there, so increasing home cooking. And French uh, guidelines are now saying that you need to be moving for 30 minutes every day, like brisk walking. You want to go towards, so that's the middle aisle, you want to go towards eating things like pasta, rice every day, but include like whole grain sources. 
Um, they also recommend having a like a fatty fish and a, a, a like a lean fish twice a week. So one one time fatty fish like salmon and one time like lean fish like cod. Uh, also encouraging things like walnut oil, which is a great oil uh, to get in your pantry. So walnut oil, rapeseed oil, which we know is canola, olive oil, and then including things like butters and olive oil also in moderation. Um, twice a day for dairy products, eating in season, and if you can to eat organic. And then we want to reduce alcohol consumption, sugar beverages, sugar products, salt products, Charcuterie is about five ounces a week, meat um, about a pound a week, and then decreasing uh, high intakes of foods that have Nutri-Score D and E's or their less nutritional value, and also decreasing the time sitting and being on screens. You can go to the website Manger Bouger uh, there. You can hit Google Translate. It's a great site for like recipes. Um, it's in the references. So go on there and take a look. On, on some of the things that you know are in that website because there's some really great recommendations. So to explore more, you can go and look at some of the studies that I put in about, about how the French eat and relationship to, to health. And then um, to, to uh, uh, connect with us uh, more, more, you can connect with Michelle at the Taste Workshop or Instagram website, and then she is having that upcoming cookbook. So you go on there today and click in to get that VIP, the first chapters of her great cookbook that she is um, she is producing. You can connect with me on my email there, my Instagram, or um, my website also. Mary and Michelle, I honestly just want to say, wow, that we could not have asked for a better last Dairy World Tour episode. And we have some wonderful questions that have rolled in. So I'm going to go ahead and, and kick it off with those. Um, first one we'll start with. So one of our attendees asked, and I love this question, what does the workday look like to allow time for cooking and eating these amazing meals? What does the workday in France typically look like? Hey, that's a great question. Uh, if you don't mind me, uh, you know, it is, it, it's okay, but I hope it's okay, Michelle. So the workday is um, starts around eight and ends around 6.30. But what's, so during the week, you know, the, you're not eating a gastronomic meal. What you do is um, if you're at work, you would tend to, you know, stop for an hour and enjoy a meal. So a lot of work environments now have a cafeteria or you go to a restaurant, uh, typically you go home. So you have this long break. But the French uh, tend to like do things like they'll cook a huge pot of vegetable soup and that's what you eat, you know, every night, you know, for dinner, you know, you have vegetable soup, you bring out a salad and your cheese plate. So that's what you would eat in the evening. So that's how the work, you know, you're kind of batch cooking a bit and having that. And then on the weekends, you're enjoying more of a, these gastronomic meals. Perfect. And then Michelle, one of the attendees did ask, do we get to see the finished product of the roasted cauliflower gratin? Oh, sure, here we go. <laughs> Since you're asking, let me just give it a little stir. I put, I put some of the munster in it and this is a double batch. So I don't know if you can, if you can see, but oh, look at that nice thick, uh, uh, it's a little bit cheese. I'm gonna throw the, the rosemary in there too and I'll take it out later. So voila, so Tien. <laughs> Oh, it's beautiful. I could probably, you know, distribute it a little bit better. And then I'm going to just put it under the broiler to get it much darker and get some crispy, you know, tops that taste extra flavorful. So thanks for asking. I did want to mention, because somebody said that they had made the Petit VA and added time. I think it was Marge. And that's a great addition. Time is my favorite. Look at I have it, I grow tons of it. So I, I always have some just as a case for an emergency. But I wanted to mention that there is a difference between puff pastries. It's pretty um, ingredient wise. So Pepperidge Farm is a non-butter based puff pastry. And I think sometimes people have told me they've been surprised they didn't realize that because Puff pastry, when you make it, it's butter. It's all about laminating the layers with butter, cold butter. But the Preppage Farm is non-butter based. So it's um, very different in terms of the flavor and some of the textures you get. It is a, a great product for many things. It's just different 
then um, here's just a Trader Joe's. I'm not pushing any brands, by the way. <laughs> it's just that they have theirs that comes out during the winter. And then there's also Dufour's is another one that you can find. So there's not a lot of options in the U.S. to get butter-based puff pastry. But if you have a chance to, uh, try it. It's, it's interesting. They're both good and have, do different things. But the, the butter, you know, butter has water in it. It adds extra evaporation opportunities, which makes the laminations go higher. So you get more crunch uh, for that. Uh, so I'd point that out. Oh, that's fun. That's a good call out and a little experiment for people to try to see if they can taste full. Okay, we had another question. Um, this person asks, so any tips for recreating the amazing croissants in, and I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna butcher it, but Pen au chocolat here in the States? I know, a great bakery. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know, I've only made them a few times. So I am not a baking expert. I have zero patience or limited patience for, for baking. So I'm, I don't know, Mary, if, if you've done a, a lot, but I mean, one of the things I can tell you from the chef friends I have that do wonderful uh, uh, croissants here in the state, cold butter. You have to constantly keep it cold. You have to keep your counters cold and also getting a low water uh, percent butter. So French butter is going to have a much lower water percent than unsalted butter here um, that you often buy unless it's specially made for that. We have, um, I think it might be John that said, do you need help eating all that? Yes, he's available. <laughs> And then let's do, so I have another question here. Um, Vandana asked, so she has a lot of, she's a dietitian, has a lot of vegetarian clients that she counsels for, and she's loving to learn more about the difference between animal rennet and microbial rennet, if either of you have any thoughts or knowledge to share on that. I, I don't, I mean, I haven't researched which, why it's used in some places and others, and if there's limitations. That would be what I'd be interested in, but I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, great question. I, I don't know the answer to that either. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll all have to do a little research. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one, wonderful question, Vandana. Um, and then one more, you guys, and then everyone that's on the line, hang on, because we have our Dairy World tour raffle and recap video. Um, but this question was about the fromage fray, I think it was. So Mary, you had mentioned it um kind of can be like a curds and whey sort of situation is it like a cottage cheese or not not at all okay no that's a great question no it's not like a cottage cheese but um you know you 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 do see the curds but it's not like the big curds that you would say it's very subtle um okay. but very yeah so it's very nice so it's not like eating cottage cheese no okay mm -mm. we'll have to keep our eyes <laughs> out for it to try it well, ladies, if if you haven't looked at the chat, everyone is saying thank you. Oh my gosh, this dish is delicious. They've had a wonderful time today, learned so much. So nothing but amazing compliments in the chat. And I have to echo it. You both have given us a wonderful presentation. It's been so much fun, such a great experience. Um, thanks to everyone that joined us today and is on the line. And we have our final giveaway for Dairy World Tour. So we have a wonderful um, French themed gift basket per recommendations from Michelle and Mary. So included is a three piece cheese, three piece cheese knife set, a mini gratin dish set, a French rolling pin, a French baking dish and a Dairy West cheese board. So Mary and Michelle, I'm gonna ask you, can I have a drum roll please? We're gonna announce the winner live. Yes. All right, congratulations, Lisa Howard. You're the winner of the giveaway today. Um, we'll grab your information after the episode and we'll send you your gift box. And again- I know Lisa, she's an IACP. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, you guys, you know, can't say it enough. Thank you so much for joining us, Mary and Michelle. Again, this was absolutely wonderful. Everyone on the line, we hope you have thoroughly enjoyed your Dare World Tour experience. We know that we did. And carry on the Go Global, buy local concept, um, keep exploring, keep buying local products. 
And we have one final recap video for you. So enjoy it and have a great day and happy holidays. Food to me, hands down, is always memories. I feel like when I travel, I remember a certain place that I visited. It reminds me of family members, a certain restaurant, friendships, so many, so many memories. Food has such a deep meaning into my life. It's hard to say that food is just one thing because food means so much in so many ways. Food is love. Food is culture, food is education, food is chemistry, food is social, food is a connector, food is health, food is everything. Food to me is really something to be savored. It's a joyous experience. It's something that connects us to our memories, to our heritage, to our culture, and in how crazy life gets here, we sometimes miss out on that. My big mission is to simplify those recipes and make sure that we can still have a fabulous tasting meal that's authentic to its roots, but doesn't take seven or eight hours to put together. That's my life. <laughs> really being around my grandparents and my parents who literally lived off the land. And that really, I would have to say, is the first bond, the first connection I've ha I had with food.